And in, this, in that Second Continental Congress, they created what they called the Township Survey System, which is six miles by six miles, 36 sections, one mile on a side, and each township reserved one section to support schools. And the land-grant university system we've got in America, basically from the Allegheny Mountains to the West Coast, uh, is supported by that. Um, in fact, I lease a, a piece of land that was formed at statehood for the support of schools from the Department of Natural Resources. And the land-grant university system has people on staff Every crop that I listed and many more that I that I haven't grown have specialists at WSU, OSU, who are not in existence in the hemp industry. You know, we can look across the border from North Dakota to Canada, watching our neighbors actually doing uh, the work that we should be doing. But until we get that intellectual infrastructure and the infrastructure of the oilseed plants and the, and the plants to deal with the uh, with the fiber part of it, it's going to be a difficult takeoff. But it's something that that we're ready for it. Give us the opportunity, pass one more law, and get the feds off our back, and you're going to see. Well, one example here in the Pacific Northwest is is the spotted owl essentially chased the paper makers out of the Northwest forests. Okay, where did they go? Has, has anyone driven uh, in the Umatilla area, in the, in the area east of Tri-Cities between the Columbia and the Snake? There are tens of thousands of acres of irrigated farms that used to grow wheat and alfalfa and everything else that are fast-growing poplars. They take 15 to 20 years to cycle. Oh, well and good, we're not invading the forest, we're growing our copy paper in a field. But what happens is, is a farmer like me, I can't wait for 15 years to harvest a crop. It puts me out of business, and the landowners in those circles have basically converted over to James River Paper Company, Weyerhaeuser, Scott, etc., and, and frozen farmers out of business. They become huge corporate things, and the ability to have a fiber crop that's on an annual basis like corn, wheat, or anything else to help you with with uh, crop rotation and all of those other, you know, plant cycles and, and economic cycles. Just give us a law. You'll see us. Thank you. Passes in with Dr. Bronner's magic soaps. Uh, Dr. Browners and Hemp have been fortunate to have the opportunity to grow in the natural products industry over the past 10 years or so. Um, it's experienced phenomenal growth, uh, over 25%. And uh, since Dr. Browners started using hemp about 10 years ago, uh, we have exceeded that. We've been experiencing near, nearly 40% growth every year, taking these wonderful hemp products out in beyond the natural food stores that we started in um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and now we're in the likes of Target and Walgreens and CVS pharmacies, um, more conventional grocery stores. The demand is there for organic body care, and hemp, of course, is an essential and fantastic ingredient. Um, for our soaps, and we've also expanded our line into including other moisturizers, taking the benefits of hemp into um, lip balm and lotions, um, our new or all organic hair care products. Oh. Um, <laughs> and um, so we've also, in the uh, growth of that industry here in the United States, been fortunate enough to catch on to the world growth of it. Um, so now our products are available in Europe, uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, South Korea, the UK, um, Israel, and it's only appropriate that they go back to where they, many of the ingredients came from. We are fortunate to also be uh, fulfilling Dr. Bronner's vision of uniting Spaceship Earth. We're sourcing our ingredients and we're sending our products back out all across the planet. Um, our ingredients are now sourced organically and we're starting to switch everything over, uh, over 95% of the soaps ingredients are also sourced fair trade, fulfilling that vision, taking, you know, hemp and the whole natural um, concept, getting back to these 
things that you know we don't need these petrochemicals we can do with what we can make um, so we are um, sourcing our hemp oil from Canada which is also now incorporating the fair trade standards as well. Um, one of the things that, you know, it's great to be involved in the whole world, you know, unification of buying and selling, but what we would like to do is also take advantage of the local and, and sustainable movements and try and source our hemp oil right here in the United States. I started a company called Crucial Creations back in 1993 um, after uh, having a uh, another company called Ashes and Dust in 1991. So we've been doing uh, hemp textiles for a long time. We've seen textiles come from from basically distributors that, that, that get it from China where China's never stopped making hemp. They've always had a hemp industry and they've always needed hemp for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, the, the textiles have been used in funeral rites for the Han Chinese for thousands of years. So um, I had heard about these things, I had seen the fabrics, I would come to a lot of festivals, on, um, not unlike this one, where um, the legalization of marijuana is advocated in, in, in relationship to also hemp uh, uh, legalization efforts. So um, the, these things are nice at Seattle Hemp Fest, here we are at Seattle Hemp Fest, there, there, there is a lot of um, uh, pro uh, marijuana legalization uh, information about and medical marijuana uh, information, which, which definitely we, we want to support. But like Adam was saying earlier, um, there seems to be a little less focus uh, on, on the industrial hemp aspects, which uh, at, at a lot of at a lot of the events that I go to now. Um, so. Uh, We'd like to see the consumers uh, being uh, of, of the medical marijuana being a little bit more involved with with uh, uh, understanding all aspects of, of what this plant can do for us. It's, it's unfortunate that a non-drug plant has, um, you know, gotten mixed up with this, and and it does have to do with the whole history of it. Uh, if you study Jack Harris. Uh, Emperor wears no clothes. You'll find out a lot about the history and the conspiracy theories, which uh, initiated my company to to start and to get these products out out in the marketplace, so that people could actually see and touch and feel industrial hemp products and now eat eat them as a result of uh, and, and 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 bathe with them. So there's there's so many amazing things. I. Uh, but I had always seen them in the context of these festivals. So one time I had the opportunity to go to China actually and, and see the, the hemp being used by the people there. And for them, it's, it's, it's uh, actually becomes a matter of life and death hemp. So on, on a very basic economic level, you need to tie up your animals. And when your animals are sick, you need to feed them a, a, a nutritional substance that that's, uh, has all essential vitamins and minerals to enable your animals to get better. And, and, and these are wonderful benefits of the plants that people in other countries are enjoying that, that, that we can enjoy. And I've seen it on the family farm level where the economics of it are life and death. And then I've seen it on the state level where um, you know, whole villages are, are, are contracted out to, to grow monocultures of hemp, which then get produced into to paper fibers and and so it, it, it definitely goes on and on, and, and, and uh, the uses of hemp are so multilateral. Here, here the Dr. Bronner's booth is, is made out of a byproduct of the fiber uh, industry. So, so we have fibers here, and if anybody wants to take a look, these are the fibers that we're, we're actually distributing um, hemp flax for, for uh, North America, and these are the fibers coming from that. We have the byproduct, the herds. This is actually a byproduct. We couldn't figure out what to do with it. Uh, we had factories full of it, so now it's being used for animal bedding. There's there's talks about it. Um, you know, like I said, the booth for Dr. Bronner's is is being made out of a composite board from it, and uh, and and this thing just goes on and on and on. The, the, the more we start using it, the more uses there are for it. I think we're up to the thirty-six thousands or something. <laughs> So we're looking for one day where we where we could see, you know, ultimately plant species freedom. We should be able to to, to use all aspects of this this plant. And uh, so give thanks for these festivals that are bringing some amount of awareness to to this. And uh, thanks for being here. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny, and thank you all. It's uh, 